kind of a lonely world out there when you're doing this all on your own. So thanks for that. And we'll jump in. I was asked to come and talk about an overview of the publishing industry. So that's the what I've prepared for you today. I prefer to be more interactive than talking head. So um, we're going to play with that a little bit. I know it's virtual and you might be not even here I'm not, <laughs> or something, but I'm assuming you are. And I'll throw out questions to you as we kind of go along. And I really invite you to throw your video on, join us in the chat unmute yourself and shout out the answers to the questions that I might ask you. Um, I will not make them too complicated, I promise. But the more interactive we can be, I think the more fun we'll have today for the next uh, 40 minutes, maybe an hour here. So in terms of a structure, I mentioned to your team before you, most of you got on that I'm a very much a control freak, very much into structure. So I have to have an agenda so I know where we're going and what we're going to talk about. So we'll discuss the size and scope of the US publishing industry, the paths to publishing, which may be familiar to you, but never hurts to kind of refresh and rethink about opportunities that are available to you as you're going through your publishing process. Um, and then maybe we can have a little dialogue about what it means to be indie from your perspective and kind of what draws you to this line of work, if you will, because from my perspective, um, indie publishing is work. It's a business, it's a profession. Um, it requires uh, an understanding of an industry. So something draws you here. And I'm curious about what that would be. Um, I'm noticing I don't have animation in these slides. So answers are, we'll see what happens with that. I mentioned I wanna be as interactive as possible, but no trick questions. So if you think you know the answer to what I'm asking you, you probably do. That's, that's my caveat on that. So don't be afraid to shout it out. So let's start then with the size and the scope of the US publishing industry. But first I'm gonna go broader um, and I'm gonna talk about global. Just Let's just go all the way up and out so we can get a sense of the size of the global publishing industry. So here's a definition. There's a link, um, Charlotte or um, Ed can send you these slides. I'm very happy for you to have them. The, the industry comprises enterprises known as book publishers, um, very, known design, editing, marketing activities necessary for producing and distributing books. If you didn't know that was a definition of publishing, there you go. And the market size uh, for the global industry is 119 billion. With the number of businesses, you can see at 16,000 and the employees at just over 315,000. So what are some observations that you guys have about those numbers? This is the silent throw it out to the audience part of the meeting. There's a lot of white noise out there. <laughs> a lot of white noise. Is the industry yeah, I mean, like, just let me explain. Um, there's a lot of competition, you know, like there's just an avalanche of, of stuff to get people's attention, you know, to get through, to get people's attention. The market size in particular. We will talk about this is the volume of books that get published through, yes. Is the industry employment going down significantly because of the COVID? Yes, in some ways, in some parts of the industry. One statistic I'll give you in a little bit, which I'll just um, highlight here since the question was asked. Um, one in seven indie bookstores are closing during COVID. So there are definitely parts of the industry that are, are not faring as well as we would hope. Um, and then there are some though, like self-publishing, which growing and growing and growing. So it kind of depends on, on where you are in the industry. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what, I'm interested you said that Charlotte, because when I look at these numbers, what I think about the global book industry based on the statistics is that it's pretty small, I think. $119 billion, um, only if you will, 16,000 businesses, it's not huge. There's a small kind of group that does the majority of this work in the publishing industry. And you know, only 315,000 employees in the world that work in traditional publishing. So we would, we would joke sometimes when we'd go to large conferences that you know, we could go and there'd be 30 people at that conference that ran the book publishing industry, quote unquote. Um, the average industry growth is down there at the bottom. This always, I, for me, it's always kind of shocking to think about and see a 0.3% average industry growth. We talk about that a lot in the book industry. We say flat is the new up 
as long as we close a year and start a new year and we've grown or we've just kind of status quo ourselves and we're like, okay, we can take a breath. We're okay. We're not, we're not going downhill in terms of sales and such. So in the global perspective, um, industry growth is 0.3%. And let's look now and take this idea, which, you know, I'm, I'm positing is a small industry and let's take it to the U S which I would say, you know, U S is a fraction of the global and none of my animation is going to work. So we're just going to see the numbers. I think, let's see. Yep, so this is the US book industry market size. And there's a link here that you guys can go in and check it out too. 25 billion. Um, our statistics in the book industry are slow to come to us. So that's why we have 2018 data up here. We don't have 2019 data all the way through yet. 25 billion is the complete size. And I put the other, some other industries that I think about I definitely think about apparel industry because I like it and video gaming industry. So you can kind of get a sense of how big it is from that perspective. So not huge, kind of small and kind of flat. This is a look at that $25 billion print and ebook sales. It's another way to kind of look at what's happening here. And I will describe a few things that I'm seeing, but since this is a slide that didn't give away my answers, um, I'll ask you guys to reflect a little bit on what you might see when you look at this slide, when you're looking at the print and ebook sales for the US publishing industry. Well, it looks like ebooks are going down, right? It does look like ebooks are going down. Like they, they didn't take over the world like some thought they would, right? I'll give you one anecdote in 2010, I guess that was 10 years ago now, um, as part of my job with the book industry study group, we commissioned a report called consumer attitudes toward ebook reading. The main question of that entire report was would ebooks cannibalize the sale of print books? Our assumption was yes, and we just wanted to know to what degree. The findings that we've seen over the past 10 years is actually it's it's kind of a no, has been a no. Let me give you a caveat for pandemic life here, but ebook sales have been about 30%, and they shrink and they've shrunk a little bit, you know, when they came out in the market and they were new and people were trying them out and downloading a lot of free content. There was, it was a little bit more, but people still really like print. I mean, you hear that all the time about the publishing industry. So you, you, the ebook market traditionally pre pandemic has been about 30% of sales in, in our market. Are you going to cover get? Amazon share, or, or Angela, are you going to cover Amazon share of this market? I'll talk a little bit about Amazon related to self publishing. Yes. And then I can answer specific questions if I don't if I don't kind of hit on that one thing you're thinking about. Okay. Anything else jump out? Yeah. Um, can you hear me, Angela? Yeah, absolutely. Um, say your say your I, name out loud for the audience, if you would. <laughs> I, uh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I was trying to be the uh, fly on the wall. <laughs> 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 um, I, I've been really interested to see how KDP has plummeted ebooks in general have plummeted. Of course, um, Barnes and Noble and their huge problem with the with the um, the uh, <clears throat> um, hack that they had recently, which just killed the Nook, was probably um, a big factor. And although this isn't in, in your slide here at all, but it seems to me like um, the the two major factors that have killed the ebook. Is are one that um, the, a lot of the publishers jack the prices up for ebooks to like within a dollar or two of what it costs to buy the print book, and also that um, the the technology just wasn't memorable. I mean, you you didn't you didn't keep the book in your head like you did when you read it on paper. Uh huh. Yeah. So in response to the second point, I think. I think that's very interesting. Interesting that when I talk to people more in my age, I'll, I'll just give you a hint. I'm in my 40s, not the first part of my 40s. 
back part of my 40s. Um, and I'm not a digital native, so I really feel that strongly. I feel like I don't remember things that I read digitally to the degree that I do when I read them in print. But I also grew up on print, and I understand that that's how my brain learned. I think digital natives are going to bring a different experience to reading. So none of this, I feel like, is true, true, true forever, ever. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of where we are. And majority of readers right now, long form reading, book reading, not tweet reading and Instagram reading, um, are people in 30s and 40s. So, you know, we're the ones that are kind of keeping this here. And we're saying ebooks are great for some things. But when I really want to settle down on my couch, I pick up a print book. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And in terms of KDP and cannibalizing, there's there's a slide that'll talk about market share of eBooks and print books um, through the self-publishing platforms in one second. All right, I'm going to make two my, my own two points about this slide, but maybe somebody I'm going to have a little space for that person who's like, I think I can, I want to say it, but I'm not sure. So a little space for you to pop up here with an observation before I give you two of my own and we move forward. I came in late, so I hate to interrupt you and stuff. Hi, everybody. I'm Carol Gino. David, Hi, Carol. Me. Hi how are you? Um, I suppose if I were looking at this without hearing anything you said until now, I would be saying, oh, my God, my biggest thing is Audible. Where are the Audible books in here? And the two other things are for people way older than you, Angela. I can tell you that ebooks work for me because I can make the text big, bigger. And if I remember even a small part of something, I can search for it on Kindle where I can't do the same thing in a book. You know, I have to dog ear it and put, you know, post-it notes all over it, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And the price of paper has like, because I don't just write those small books that are, um, not books like we used to write. You know, my books were all, uh, like 350 pages. It be the cost of it becomes prohibitive of the, of the paper books at that time. So I seldom buy a hardcover until after I've looked at the Kindle and seen whether it was really something I want to have in hard book back because it's a real book. Yeah, they're getting more and more expensive. You're you're better than me. I just go right out and grab that hardcover, and then I have a stack of these irrelevant books from my perspective that weren't weren't really that great. After all, probably not worth thirty dollars. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone's gonna. I'm glad you shared that experience. Everyone's gonna lean into a different format in a different way. And yes, this is not talking about audiobooks, which is definitely a growing market. And I'm sure you guys will have a, some content in the conference. Um, Charlotte can raise her hand to say yes to that probably, or Ed. Um, we would have a lot of audiobook content in our conference because it's something for folks to, you know, figure out. Now, a lot of these places, a lot of this is kind of, that vertical is really, taken over by the big five, which we'll look at in a second. So it's difficult to kind of make inroads, but you still need to be there and still need to be part of the conversation. So great, thank you for jumping in. And I love you brave souls, more is coming, more interaction. So my two observations are this. One is we saw on the last screen that um, the growth rate of the global publishing industry was 0.3%. And here we're seeing the compound annual growth rate is a negative 4% for the US publishing industry. So it's just an acknowledgement of the tight, tight, tightness of our industry itself and how it's, again, flat is the new up. Um, we really were trying to maintain the pandemic hit. And the, I know for a fact there's a, some conversation about pandemic publishing today, I think, later on in your schedule, I encourage you to go to. Um, so that's changed things a little bit, but it's very tight. So if you think it's the competitive market, and you felt that in the work that you're doing, you're absolutely right, and this is why, because this is what the numbers say. So that's one observation. The other is in what they, they've written there, which is you have to look below the top line to understand the real shifts. So what that means is, yes, there's some shrinking in that ebook um, total market share, but it's, it's little, right? And then the rest of it is kind of copacetic, if I'm using that word correctly, meaning adult, paperback sales or adult print book sales 
kind of the same. Definitely some shifts based on whether there was a big book in that genre, but basically the same. And what that means is, particularly in our traditional industry, is consumers have space for not a ton of books in their lives. So they'll just replace that the one memoir they read on mass with the next memoir that they read on mass. The one self-help book gets replaced by the next self-help book and it kind of just stays static, if that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, pop, pop in and let me know. Um, it's why it's difficult to publish memoir. Um, it's why it's difficult to publish some self-help stuff because they're just, there's one kind of one book, which brings me to a question. How many, how many books do you think the average American reads in, in a year? You guys don't count because I assume you're readers or listeners. Maybe 10. 10 or 12, one a month. That is lovely. The answer is one. I would say <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, don't think with your brains because you're like, oh, I probably read two. I don't know how. I mean, I read 12 or 12 less than 20 personally you know if you can get through one a month and in, in a busy life i think a lot of people would call you a, a reader um so the majority of people read one book and in some years that's going to be like becoming michelle obama book or it's going to be harry potter it's going to be that one book and it's you know it's hard to kind of break out in on mass one book crazy town so you can see how in this chart at least it's just a book replacing another book, replacing another book. There's not a lot of uh, variety, if you will, that gets sold. Now I'm gonna throw a today headline in and we'll move to the next. So this data goes through 2019, which is great for the publishing industry. It's like uber current. Um, today I read in our Publishers Weekly newsletter that while well, the pandemic is gonna change a lot of things, the headline was profits jumped 45% at HarperCollins. So if you think about that, we wonder if the book industry is growing or not. And the, the jump was a 20% increase in digital revenue. So that's talking about eBooks and audiobooks, and a 28% jump in direct to consumer sales. So all of your big publishers are kind of playing around with that during pandemic and during COVID and they're selling more digital and they're selling more direct less through bookstores, obviously, which have been closed and library sales have been way down because the library budgets have been cut during pandemic. So yeah, so that's dri dri driven up their profits by 45% and sales by 13% in HarperCollins anyway. So this, the market's gonna shift a little bit. Will it, it's pretty, it's not super, I mean, super elastic though, or it is super elastic. The thing is it's gonna, it's gonna contract again, I think. So it's gonna move and shake during pandemic, but if we ever get to a normal, maybe the new normal, maybe it looks a little bit like our old normal, I think uh, consumers are very hard to change their habits on mass and we'll probably kind of contract back into something like this, but we'll see some changes. So these um, are the big five. Animation, would have, I would have asked you what they are and you would know that they're the big five. I never remember them. So if they don't pop to your mind, that's cool. The main thing I wanted to point out is that these, um, if you're generally, if you are self-publishing or working in the space, you're working in the trade book industry, trade being consumer focused books, things that you think the general reader would be interested in that are gonna be sold through general trade channels like the bookstores and the libraries. Again, those are our more specific trade channels um, and some things online. So if you are in that market and those are the kinds of books that you're writing and perhaps publishing, um, this is just to say that at this point already, 80% of that market is subsumed by these five publishers. So the books that are going to be put on the shelves, that are going to be bought by the librarians, et cetera, about 80% of that is already taken. So we're, we're really fighting for this 20% extra space that they've left available for the quote other type of publishing. And that's not just like the self-publishers or the hybrid publishers or others. Um, that's 
even the indie publishers, like the larger indie publishers that are bigger, bigger than big companies, but smaller than the big five. So 20% of the space is what we're looking at. And Penguin Random House, well, they just cover the market, don't they? Angela, we had a question. Sure, of course. Do comic books count in this? No, comic books no. wouldn't be in trade because they're more special sales. Um, although there's some crossover and that will happen as well, but I wouldn't say that this is strain comics. If you're doing comics, it is a special sales market and your distributor would be diamond distributor usually. And there's some of it that works through the traditional space, but a lot of it is through a special sales space that goes to comic book shops and, and things of that nature. Unless you're like, remember mouse? I don't know, maybe something like that. Something that comes through and feels a little more literary and everybody or Neil, I never say his name right, Gaiman or Gaiman, Neil Gaiman, Neil Gaiman. Um, his books will often be shocked or stocked at a trade space. So graphic as well. novels of a certain topic may count. Yeah, of a certain gravitas, author gravitas, if you will. Yeah. And Angela, can I uh, can I say something to you? I don't know whether this is helpful or not, but after I wrote Me and Mario, and because Mario Puzo was such a big deal in publishing, I figured I'd offer it to some of the big publishers first. And I talked to two uh, of the heads of two of them. And they said to me, if I really wanted to ha have any kind of longevity on it and everything, that independent publishing was better to do because <laughs> if the, five, the big five are going down like the Titanic is what they were saying. Now, this is from the inside and this is from people who I talked to, but it seemed to leave more opportunity for us because the big publishers have to publish like books, books that made it in the past where we can bridge new territory and stuff and we don't have the kind of budgets they had. And these were people who were really smart and really savvy and knew what was going on and were actually people I trusted, you know? Mm -hmm. That's for us. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I do. Uh, gosh, it's a, it's a, I, it's hard to say. I, I feel like I'm betraying somebody when I say, yeah, big five publishers really are not doing well. I mean, we just heard that HarperCollins did very well quarter Q1 over the last quarter during the pandemic, but it is true. I mean, there, there's not a lot of opportunity there for a lot of variety of books. Something we'll talk about for sure in the next, um, I think we have 40 minutes or so. Um, I appreciate that. And I do think there's a lot of opportunity for indies. This is not, this is a door that's very, very thick. This big five door is very, very thick. You, you guys have probably had that um, experience. Perhaps some of you have had that experience trying to knock on this door. I think you, did you end up self-publishing that book? Oh yeah, I did. And actually the people, the first book I did, I, I was done by Simon and Schuster and then Bantam. My latest book is Me and Mario. Uh, I independently published that. And when I did this, this nurse's story sold over a million copies for Simon & Schuster and Bantam. And I finished Mario's last book called The Family, which is also, all, most of my books were on the bestseller list. And still their whole thing is they, they publish past, not forward. I mean, we're the ones who are gonna have to come up with the new narratives, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're using um, another buzzword that some of you know is comp titles. So they're really trying to see what's sold before and then try to, re they're trying to recreate the magic in a bottle. And I've joked with my friends lately that you see it in the covers too, which isn't a terrible thing to understand as an indie publisher what are the trends you know you definitely need to play into that because that consumers are buying in that space but our the covers are just so the same there's this one look on a cover which is blocky people they're just people made out of full colored blocks i could grab one i've got like seven of them on my shelf right now so yeah there, there's a lot of like well we'll fall this trend into the ground and then maybe we'll pick up another one um, to answer uh, Makar's question, juvenile does fit into trade. So Dave, 
Helki, he would be in this trade space too. Thank you for that. Feel free to share experiences, guys. I really, I really appreciate that. So next we're gonna look then, so this is big five. Okay, fair. Let's see how it changes. Um, so I wanted to acknowledge it. Actually, I don't remember, or I didn't hear your name who just spoke up, but something that the lady that just spoke was kind of acknowledging and talking to, which is, yes, it's 80% of the market, but it is, it's not everything and it doesn't have all of the power that it used to have. This is something Mark Coker um, from Smashwords said many, many years ago, and I always come back to it. Um, you might have been able to read it already, but I'll just say it, what it says, which is the power to create great books and the power to distribute great books is transferring to the author. So just a few years ago, publishers controlled the printing press and they controlled access to retail distribution. So if you couldn't get your book printed and you couldn't get it distributed, you'd never reach readers. But today the printing press is completely democratized. So this is an important kind of inflection point that makes what um, the lady said before true is this statement that the printing press is completely democratized. Sounds very high fluting, fair enough. Um, so my question to you is what does that mean? What does it mean when he says the printing press, what happened? Uh, I'll even give you a decade. What happened in the 1990s to completely democratize the printing press? This is a kind of, this is a tough question. Would it be the, would it be the advent of eBooks? Would that, would that be what you're talking about? No, no, it really does have to do with printing uh, physical books. Print on, demand. print on demand. Yeah, this is John Meyer. I think that the digital press really made a big impact because it allowed for a lot shorter runs so that independent publishers and uh, authors who wanted to self-publish didn't have to invest in thousands and thousands of books. They could run smaller runs and that really helped people. You got it, nailed it. Absolutely, print on demand. And that was in the mid nineties. Um, so, you know, not that long ago, we were all, some of us still, you know, in business at that time, mid nineties. Prior to the nineties, there were certainly self publishers and people that were publishing on a small scale, but the monetary outlay that you needed to do what the only technology available, which would be an offset print one, made it much smaller as an industry. That's why the big five were able to just kind of take over the market. But print on demand in the 90s meant anyone could make, essentially make content available, if you will, to be printed when, when purchased. Um, I always, I like to say make content available because I, I have to put my IBPA hat on and say, here's the difference between publishing and all the things that go into publishing professionally and then, and just making your content available through a POT platform. And that in, in that tension lies what makes great self-published books or and uh, kind of not so great self-published books. And we all can admit there's a lot of not so great self-published books. So um, print on demand, really, really big. Well, I, re I really benefited from printing on demand. Uh, I'm Ray, uh, I benefited because it freed up my basement uh, that I didn't have to store books there right. any longer that I didn't really want or couldn't get rid of. Uh, but on the other hand, the bad, the downside to uh, Coker's uh, quote is a lot of stuff got into the market that was just crap. People could publish anything and uh, it made it very hard for the consumer or reader to figure out was this a worthwhile book or to, to actually get and there was very little advanced information or anything that you could you could help you with. So in addition to Smashwords starting up all types of book review uh, websites started to appear, uh, evaluating the quality uh, of the various books. So I was really happy to see that uh, trend also occur in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I promise, well, I, I didn't promise, but this is a great place for me to say the word metadata. I'm <laughs> Charlotte said, will you say metadata in your presentation? I said, I don't, I don't plan to, but let me say it now because you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things that will set apart not a great self-published book. What, what the consumer can look for is the professionalism of the metadata, the degree to which it's complete, well done, 
describes things well. You know, there's a way to write an author bio that is riveting and interesting. And then there's a way to just say my name, you know, the author's name is Angela and she lives in Redondo Beach, California. Um, metadata is key and an important part of the publishing process that kind of will really help set if you are self-publishing your self-published book apart because I'm going to show you the numbers and there's a lot. I think, you know, spoiler, there's a lot self-published books. So print on demand in the 90s was big. The other thing Mark Coker is saying in here is that um, there's some sort of access to retail distribution that is now more ubiquitous than it used to be. And that's the one place where I think he's not quite right. Like absolutely print on demand makes the content available, but for the most part, you're going to be selling on the online platforms like Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or any number of different online platforms there are out there to sell on. It's still very difficult to get a print on demand into a brick and mortar bookstore. Sometimes difficult to get it into a library. But uh, yeah, the retail district, the brick and mortar retail space hasn't been super duper friendly, definitely changing, but we don't get a lot of self-published books and, or a lot of um, print on demand books into the retail space. I want to acknowledge that that's always been true. And the other quote I'll bring up is, did anybody read this long tale? Can you believe it was 14, 15 years ago? This had a big impact. Um, on the publishing industry, of course, and on a lot of industries. And it's this is just basically that acknowledgement that more than 99% of music albums on the market today are not available in Walmart, same for any other leading retailer, and uh, practically any other commodity, including books. The vast majority of products are not available at a store near you, which is important to point out because that's how most of us are selling right now, not in a bookstore. So we have, there you go, David's got it. <laughs> it was, yeah, I remember I saw him speak in 2006-ish or something when the book came out and we were all like, oh, we should look at that long tail because shelf space is expensive, you know, and you're not gonna really get there. So your goal as any publisher that's not one of those big five is to figure out how to sell not in a brick and mortar space. and by the way, you're in good company because 99% of all sales that happen are in that space. So you're not alone. Yeah, with, with that, that book did, as you were saying, Andrew, that book did have a big impact. And with storage being, you know, practically free, I mean, it's not totally free, but with access going global with the internet and then storage being very, very cheap, you could have millions of books available, which is sort of what Amazon was doing with it and a lot of these other companies. That's right. Can I jump in here? Absolutely. Hi, this is Pam Fenner. I'm sitting in a parking lot while my husband's at the dentist holding my iPhone. So I'm trying to figure out how to, how to do this instead of on my iMac. I published my first book in 1990. And um, I can remember going down to uh, Xerox or somewhere, Kinko's in uh, California and putting in um, uh, a disc and out the other end of the DocuTech machine um, came a book. And that was pretty revolutionary in terms of, yeah, it was print on demand, but I can remember specifically that particular machine. Um, and um, I used it for um, the first book and for um, pamphlets and all sorts of things for marketing. The other trend I think that might've started in the 1990s was um, uh, niche publications. I, we first saw this perhaps with magazines where you had your general magazines for families or women but then you started getting all these very um, narrow focused magazines for the last 20 years or more uh, with bicycling or house building or particular focus. And you go into a magazine store and it was just, it seemed like there were 50 times more titles to look at than, than there were a few years before. And of course, there's the niche publishing 
um, self-publishing as well, which is what I do for 30 years. Yeah, there's a lot. And I like that you mentioned niche because um, A, I think it's definitely helped by print on demand. And, you know, there's this idea that there's a story for everyone. You can get very, very unique in the point of view there. Um, and also, you know, I, I find a lot of people complain a lot of people aren't happy with it, but there's a lot of complaints about just the vast amount of content that's out there too. Um, and I'll just preface again, the next slide will show you some of that. Um, but one of the things I think is good about that is that just the, the large number of unique voices that are now having an opportunity to be available. I, are they being heard? Are they being purchased and bought and shared as much as they could be? Um, I don't think that that is true yet, but there is opportunity for a lot of different types of publishing that wasn't happening at the big five. I, j I think that we were talking about how in our book club, we were reading a lot of books about like a, a white woman who moves to New York in her early twenties and has a, like an adventure. And then that was like it for a long time that was coming out of a lot of the publishing houses because that was the experience of the editors moving to New York city and becoming a publisher. And they were very drawn to those types of stories. So the unique nature of the, the different stories that can come out now is a byproduct of this and, and the niche market's a byproduct of this as well. It's a good point, Pam. I'm wondering if I could make a comment. This is Stephen MacArthur. Mm -hmm. Hi, Stephen. Hello. Hi. Hi, Stephen. Yeah. Hi. How are you? Uh, I, I, um, I'm looking at the Chris Anderson quote that you have up, <clears throat> and I am probably a perfect example of someone who was for 35 years in the music business and suffered the results of what he's describing there back in 2006 and, and which now of course uh, you know there used to be there used to be a chain of, of not a chain a a variety of of uh, record stores all over the country in the same way that there are independent bookstores all over the country right now and the example of what happened to all of those record stores is should be a, a cautionary note for us in terms of the need to preserve independent bookstores in this country. Um, and it was that experience of having no more uh, channels of distribution for CDs, uh, which was what we did. I started in the LP business and then went to the cassette business and then went to the CD business. And now all I have is the download business. It's the, all the rest of it's gone. And that's why I got into the book business because there still is, there still is, thank goodness, uh, an independent uh, distribution system. There still is a, uh, uh, an independent retail business for books. Um, and I, all of us, I just, we, we just need to do everything we can to preserve that. And I think I, IBPA is, is also a, a prime example of, of how we can preserve the independent publishing business. So that's just my comment. I like it. I like Indies standing up for Indies. I, um, I typed in the chat bookshop.org, um, which you all, if you don't know about it now, you will. They just, uh, they were launched in February of this year in the US and they just launched in the UK. Uh, the, the short story on that for you is that that is the way to buy online that isn't Amazon, that directly supports independent bookstores. I think the biggest issue independent bookstores have had is that they've not been able to tackle the online direct-to-consumer purchase angle. They, did, they have not had a really fun or interesting or well-done way for, for people to do that en masse in bookshop.org is attempting to solve that problem. And what I understood from their founder, Annie Hunter, is that uh, as of a couple months ago, the last time I was able to talk to him, what is that? In six months, they captured about three or four percent of Amazon's market share is the story. So they are their whole point is to kind of cut into that. I don't hate Amazon. This is not a we all hate Amazon story right now. Um, I just think there should be uh, additional spaces for people that aren't just Amazon. And I think the spaces that are gonna support your indie booksellers and keep their brick and mortar doors open um, are gonna be good for us, you know, holistically as an industry. So yeah, check out Bookshop and you can create your own store on Bookshop. Curate it with whatever books you want and make a commission on any books that sell through that online bookshop that you create. Yeah, right. Angela, um, mm -hmm. real quickly, 
we've got two booksellers who are going to be presenting, Stephen Porter from Stillwater Books and Jeff Meyerson from the Harvard Bookstore. And one thing about books, you know, versus records and, you know, tower records and bookstores can be a real, a real center for the community in a way that a lot of other types of places really cannot be. Because you can go get books and get coffee and talk and exchange ideas and things like that. So I think that's one of the things that's keeping some of these bookstores alive. Uh, although you said one out of seven is going out of business. Yeah, COVID. I'm, um, some new ones are opening too. I mean, that those those articles that I'm reading, I'm like, God, God bless, God bless you. You know. So there are some that had been planned; to, their doors would be opening, and and it just happened during the national pandemic. Uh, this will be hard for independent brick and mortar bookstores. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so all we can do to support them is really important. Thank you for sharing all of that, guys. Um, keep popping in. I wanted the the next thing I want to show you is just um, so if this democratization of print and distribution it was absolutely a game changer. You guys brought up more points than even I in this talk conversation, but it's resulted in a huge growth in self publishing, obviously. And I don't actually know how many of you are self publishers and how many of you are indie publishers publishing other people's work, but let's look at this huge growth in self publishing for a second. This is from Bowker, where you are likely buying your ISBNs if you are doing it, quote, correctly and assigning those ISBNs to you as the publisher. Its total ISBN output for US self publishers, its print and ebook. And this is the output, not the sales, right? So this doesn't, this doesn't say that all of these books were sold. This is just how many books went out into the marketplace. So obviously huge growth. Um, does anybody know when um, when the Kindle launched onto the marketplace? There's there's a tiny there's a tiny hint on this slide. Maybe not tiny. Two thousand eight. Yeah, just about <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no trick questions. It's two thousand and seven, I think, uh, two thousand and eight. So you know. There really wasn't much going on back then before that. It had really the Kindle absolutely revolutionized the self-publishing market as well. And that happened in 2007. And then you see this exponential growth in the number of titles that are put out on that platform to the tune of uh, 1.6 million. I just think that's astronomical. We just already said that the average consumer, the average person in the United States reads one book per year. So, Self-publishers are putting out 1.6 million, up from 1.9 million. And the traditional space, that space I talked about with the big five, their output is about 300 to 400,000. So those five publishers are only putting out, or are putting out 300 to 400,000. That's enough to kind of fill the supply chain, if you will. And then we've got an additional 1.6 million self-published books hitting the market. So my question is, uh, well, let me ask this. I forget which one moves my slides, but I will figure it out. This is a book I recommend um, by a previous chair of IBPA, uh, Greenlight Your Book, How Writers Can Succeed in the New Era of Publishing. And she talks about the biggest thing in chapter one that's affecting the book business today. Well, what do you think it is? Let me jump in. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Hi, my name is Jenya, Jenya Crane, and uh, I write in two languages. Actually, I have a, I hold MFA in creative writing from UT. And uh, I've been published, I write in Russian and English, and I've been published in Russia in hardcover by some very reputable publishing houses. And I have some publishing done here in US. I think the biggest challenge here, for me anyway, is to reach both audiences and my voice. I don't feel that my voice is being heard. And every time I approach any publishing house and I've been studying at, uh, I was at the conference at Yale with, um, uh, I was at a historical fiction with one of the chief editors of St. Martin's Press, and she was telling me that I write Russian fiction in English. 
Uh, so basically what's going on is that uh, there is a commercial um, fiction which has been written all over the place and it's been pushed in the market and <laughs> anything that is has literary value or uh, follows some standards uh, is being pushed under if you don't have a name you can't make a name for yourself uh, unless uh, somebody wants to promote you and pour money into this one of my publishers created a platform on lulu and he is a very known uh, Russian, English, French speaking publisher, writer, almost classical writer, Serge Urinen. And he created his own label and publishes people in different languages across the boards. And I was very happy to be with him. Not that I made any money following him, but at least I saw my books in print. So um, what I'm trying to say here, uh -huh. How do you produce anything of quality in this ocean of literature being uh, pushed into the market from both ends, either commercial publishers or self-publishing people? Uh huh. Well, the question of how I'm going to put a I'm going to I'm going to write that word down because we're not in this session. We're not as much talking about how do you create good content. We're talking about what is the size and scope of the publishing industry. Um, my assumption coming into presentations about this is that you have created amazing content. It's absolutely stellar already. And now you're gonna fight this industry, right? So creating good content aside, you still have to wade through these waters in order to get that amazing, wonderful, good content found. Um, and you, you've hit on two things actually that are in, in Brooke's book, and we'll talk about, you kind of answered this question. Um, let me see if there's a more direct answer to this question. And I think we're gonna keep talking about that as we move forward and get other people's point of view on it too. Can I Not just how do you create good content? I mean, honestly, that's, that, that's an entire different conversation related to publishing standards and editorial and all of those things that happen. But how do you get into the market is a no, little different. No. <clears throat> more and I apologize that there are two different activities here to write is a totally different activity than to move your product and I understand that many brilliant writers they just get discouraged so to sell yourself to sell your product is a whole different activity than to write it mm -hmm. correct correct yeah can so I'll, I'll just, just go ahead. I mean, that, that's always been true. The one thing about the traditional publishers, you know, way back, they would help you build a platform and they were run by literary people. Uh, eventually conglomerates took over. So all those, the big five were run by conglomerates. They're run by public companies that have p &L. They don't really care about literature. They need to sell books, okay? And before they could, I mean, a third of all books don't make any money that they that they produce. A third of the books make money, a third don't make money, and a third lose money. So now the burden is much more on the author to go promote and build your platform. And some authors don't care about selling, others do. But in case people don't talk about platform or in case Angela doesn't bring it up now, that's very important to, to get published and to sell books. Um, and it's much more on the burden of the author to do that these days. You're absolutely right. I feel like what, what we could do is just facilitate a round table and y'all could y'all could hit all the key points on this size and scope. Platform is really, really key. And you, and you can see, I hope you can see in this journey that we're having together this morning, um, why this becomes so important. Because sometimes people are like, why, why do people care so much? Well, with 1 million self-published and 300,000 traditionally published books that are hitting the market, how do you differentiate? This is the book on making coats that you should get and not this other book. Well, author platform is a huge part of that. Why, why is this person the person I should be listening to and not this other person? Why is this book the book I should be reading and not this other book? Sometimes it even just comes down to what's oh, just well done, designed sometimes. You know, if you're ever in a brick and mortar and you're 
you just are like, I'm drawn to that cover kind of a thing. It makes sense to me viscerally that this is something that I like because um, it's just well done. And there's so many tells. I teach a class at UCLA. I teach book publishing. So it's 10 weeks of this, which goes into a little more of what the, the lady was saying earlier, the how to make the books and just the way in which self-publishers can knock themselves out of contention by not following traditional book design, cover design and spine design and back cover design practices, you're just out. You're out immediately and it doesn't work for you because it's way too crowded. And that's the answer to this question, by the way. <laughs> According to Brooke Warner, the biggest thing affecting the book business is the volume of content that's pushed out into the book business. It's the thing that creates the most headache for you and everybody else that's involved. How do you break through that noise? Can I just add one other thing? Sure. Even though there's tr there's a ton of content and clutter and noise is everywhere, the, the technology available on Facebook and Google and places like that allow you to really micro segment. So if you know what you're doing, you can find your niche. Somebody mentioned the word niche earlier and you can find 500, 1,000, 10,000 people who are interested in medieval coat of arms from Hungary. You know, you can find people who are interested in, in um, werewolves. And you, you couldn't do that before without the technology. And so those publishers had to do it for you. Now you can get out there with, on Facebook and micro-target. I mean, that's what we were doing for this conference. We were running ads on Facebook and only trying to allure in certain people who fit the demographics. And that's what they allow. I mean, they, there's 2 billion people on Facebook. You can micro-target to, a, to a, almost an infinite degree. And that's what Chris Anderson was talking about. That's absolutely, yeah, that's absolutely right. And there's also a lot of conversation in that micro-targeting if you're gonna sell on Amazon, if, if that's an avenue you're pursuing with the keyword ads that you can purchase. And there's rabbit holes you can go down in terms of how do you pick the right ones? How much should they cost? Um, how long should you keep them up? When should you change them out? Um, that kind of like micro niche keyword level conversation about, about books now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a big, it's a big way people publish. How do you reach your audience? Who is your audience? <clears throat> I mean, these are all questions that uh, indie publishers and all publishers who are working on other people's books have to ask themselves. You have to have a, a, a clean sheet. I, I can't remember. Can't remember the name of this thing in the industry, but I'll think about it. But that just defines exactly who you're going for, where they are, how you're going to reach them. Um, it's it's important. This was a this was a joke, but we're kind of through that. <laughs> this is a uh, Maggie Marr. She's a uh, she lives in Los Angeles. She's written twelve no novels, and she's uh, she's called a hybrid author which means she's traditionally published by one of the big five. And she also self-publishes a line of her work too. She does serialized books, which by the way, highly recommended. If you get them hooked, hook them on the next one with the same characters that they already love. Keep them involved in your storyline. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just think she's funny. And she said that um, being a self-published author, being an author in general, but self-published for sure is, is having a personality between Sisyphus and a Jack Russell Terrier, like just having to move in that way, having to be so excited about it all the time, like crazy Jack Russell Terrier excited, but knowing that you're going to push the boulder up, it's going to fall back down, you're going to push it up again. It's a, it's a lot of work, but it can be fun, I hope. Are you guys having fun? Yes. What, <laughs> what, is, the name, what is your name again? Her name is Maggie Marr, M-A-R-R. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a little frog in my throat. So let's look then at these paths to publishing, which we got about um, 15 minutes. So I'm not going to go into detail on these paths. You'll get the slides and uh, maybe they're helpful to you. I don't think the paths are going to be confusing to you. So I will ask, um, oh, I'm using the wrong slides. We're going to go to the path to publishing. Could I just ask Jeff to mute? I think you've got some noise out there, Jeff. Thank you. We're talking about the size and scope. So this is in the scope category of the, of the publishing industry. Uh, what are the paths to publishing? If anyone wants to shout one out, we've used these words several times in today's presentation. 
And I am one that likes linear thinking. So there are as many variations within these paths as there are humans working within them, but I'm always going to try and like roll it up to the top. So there's a common understanding of the umbrella path. So what do you, what's one path you available to you to publish? The traditional path. Traditional. What is, yeah. And what does traditional mean when you say it? Getting a, a book contract from one of those big five or the, the independent publishers, or even even um, places like Eddie's Press, I believe, is a traditional publisher because he's not. I mean, I don't think he falls into the hybrid category. Well, great. That's perfect, and also it checks the second one, hybrid. That's your second path to publishing, and then what would be the third? If those are two and there's one more. Get an agent. <laughs> yep, but an agent will lead you to traditional publishing. Yeah, independent. Like, yep, I'll call it self-publishing just for the sake of what we are here talking about. Um, so you guys have probably all thought through this very closely. These are they're not always all available, if you will. Like not everybody who wants to get a traditional publishing contract can just get a traditional publishing contract. Obviously that's competitive, particularly with the big five. And you need an agent in order to get a big five traditional publishing contract, basically. Um, traditional publishing with a smaller press, not as difficult, that can be possible, but it's still competitive. Because traditional means the press is going to take on all the costs for publishing that book and they really have to believe in your book and what you can do with the book as an author. Um, Self-publishing and hybrid publishing, I'll, I'll leave a little space to talk about that um, because that's where a lot of people in indie publishing tend to lean because they haven't been able to crack traditional publishing as an author. And this is why, and I, you, what was interesting to me is y'all just had this conversation without me just a little while ago. One of the reasons, um, it, one thing Brooke talks about in here is what determines whether you get a book deal from a big five publisher. And it can be a big five or it can just be a traditional publisher, any publisher that's gonna take the costs on themselves. What, I'll just, if you think back to what we was just discussed by you guys earlier, You'll hit it. You'll hit it. Your platform having bringing an existing platform to them. Yep, that's right. There was another word that the lady prior had said. She said the word right out loud. I don't know whether it's commercially viable. There's the word, commercially viable. Yeah, that's the word, the buzzword the vocab word that we're looking at. So it has nothing to do with how good your book actually is and everything to do with how commercial your book and by extension you and your idea and your vision and your brand is or it has the potential to be. So that's why, again, memoir is so hard to break into a big five. That's why self-help is hard because it really is based a lot from the traditional publisher's perspective on you and, and like what you're able to push and how you're, you're able to market it, what your brand is um, and what aspects are there. So you have to think about that. If, if you can really make a strong argument for who you are and what how commercial your book will be, they need it to be commercial. Why, why do they need, why is this so important to them? Why do they need it to be commercially viable? So that they can make money to keep themselves afloat. <laughs> yeah, to make money. To make money. money. I mean, no trick questions, right? Money, money, money. Somebody money, wants money. to make some money. Let's make some money. And also, we saw they're not making any money. <laughs> like, they'd rather, they'd at least like to break even, at least. So, and smaller publishers you, are more agile and, and, like if a new, if a hot topic comes up, you can probably execute a book more quickly than a traditional publisher in their workflow, right? Mm, you, you can be a little more agile. Yeah. yeah. When I, I first started off in publishing 40 odd years ago, 
um, publishing was an inverted pyramid, and the uh, you know the the, um, the the upstart writer would get published because they were making so much money publishing the Stephen King and etc. And today that model has gone away. Every book every book has to make its own money back, and mm -hmm. it's a lot tougher to do, and it puts pressure on everybody in the whole publishing process. Okay. It does. So, it, it, you know, it's meaningful then to, un, to understand that when you're approaching your agent, if you want to go big five or, or if you're going direct to the publisher, you're likely working with an indie press who, who isn't really into working with an agent. Um, just to understand that and to put a lot of stake into your platform when you're pitching, you know, here's why I know we will sell 5,000 copies of our first print. So that's I don't know, I say 5,000 sometimes, I'm like, that's all? You really need to tell them you're gonna sell? But yeah, for, for a lot of first time books out, um, selling 5,000 copies would be great. Sounds like you're gonna learn from someone in the next keynote tomorrow, a higher, much higher sales number than 5,000. I think the lady before said a million, million copies of that book. That's pretty great. Angela, it might be worth mentioning that there are some traditional publishers like Norton and academic publishers that may have different standards in terms of what they will take because, I mean, the academics don't have to make money in the way that Simon and Schuster does because they're funded by their institution. And they are also many times trying to get a bestseller. So, um, and Norton, for example, is a major independent. Correct. Yep. Yep. Academic market is going to be a little different from the trade and to the degree that they can stay what, subsidized by a university, for example, which is a lot of ways how an academic press, um, like University of Chicago Press or any university of press, often gets subsidization, subsidization from its um, parent university. That's going away a little bit and shrinking, and we'd like to not have that happen. We want them to be able to publish books that aren't commercially viable because the ideas are important. Um, that's another part of our industry that's a very interesting one to look into. I'd just like to comment about the right side of that list, uh, if huh. I may. Sure. Uh, the, the first item on the list and the last item on the list are coming into more and more and greater conflict. And I'm hearing this from authors who are published by traditional presses. Uh, my wife was published by HarperCollins 20 years ago, and at the time, uh, HarperCollins sent her to bookstores in different states, sent her on a tour, all the airfare, uh, hotels, I mean, it was just a different world. Well, the, the thing that's happened now is that this little statement, there are no out-of-pocket costs for many traditional uh, authors, isn't true anymore. Um, they are shelling out lots of money to do that uh, marketing and PR and publicity and book events and all the rest of it because the traditional uh, presses aren't spending as much money on all of their authors as they used to. Um, so I, I, I think we really need to underscore that when it comes to uh, the big five. Mm -hmm. and exactly how they are behaving towards authors. Maybe, maybe Stephen King gets, you know, royal treatment, but, you know, a lot of authors just have to fend for themselves in many ways. They might get mm -hmm. book events and then that's it. Yeah, 100% true. Um, and when it, when it says the last bullet point, author does majority of PR and marketing, um, that is 100% true. And that does include spending your own money for that PR and marketing too. I'll just make a, a clarification that no out-of-pocket costs refers to the production of the book. You should never be asked to pay for the editing of it, the design of it, print runs, uh, you know, costs to get it stocked in shelves. Sometimes they, publishers will pay bookstores to put the book in different locations in a bookstore. So you shouldn't have to pay that. Um, so that really just references the production costs of the book. You should, I mean, I think an author should have a, a, a set of money aside, whatever they call a savings. <laughs> we have, yeah, we have savings, right? Like set aside for your marketing because here you're even going to be 
expected. Even at the highest level, you're going to be expected to spend some of your own money on the marketing, 100%. And I think I had one in here for everyone else. Um, I do. And it's, it's basically the same, except you might get a smaller royalty or you might get no advance, maybe a bigger royalty. There'll just be a little different, little different markers in the um, business arrangement, but you should still have no out-of-pocket production costs. Out-of-pocket production costs is a hybrid or a self or a service provider model. It's not a traditional publishing model, production costs. Um, so if you're asking for, ask for production costs, you're like, you're not a publisher, not traditional. One thing you know, that could be added to that list is, uh, is advance against royalties. Uh -huh. Yeah. On the traditional side, we have smallest level of royalties, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't talk about advance, does it? Yeah, you may get an advance. First time authors, depending on where you come in, it, it might not be a huge advance. Um, but yeah, you could get an advance and then you could get that royalty. That you have to offset before you make any money. What hey, do you think Angela, it's uh -huh. um, it's it's Bill. I just wanted to let you and, and everyone know we've got about five minutes left uh, in this uh, time. So uh, uh, just a heads up on that. And if um if Michael Marion Sharp is on, if you could just raise your hand so I could uh, find you, that'd be great. Thanks. Great. Well, good, because we've almost solved all the publishing industry problems. <laughs> we're going to we're going to line it out in five minutes. Um, my last data point, and then we'll we'll bop on to the end and ask answer any questions you have. Uh, we just talked about royalties and earnouts, and I assume did that make sense. What percent of traditionally published books earn out their advance? If you're paid in advance, what percent do you think earn out that advance in the publishing industry traditionally? Zip from Jack. <laughs> That's a number. I'll show you. 50%? 5%. 3%. 3%. Ah! So close. So zip to somewhere between zip and 5%. Is the, uh, the earn out on the advance. So it, it means that a lot of publishers have become more reluctant to pay advances because, you know, it's just not something that has earned out. So they may give you a royalty on each sale. Um, you may have to fight for an advance in a traditional publishing sense or any kind of a good advance anyway, just because. And the reason is, so you don't get like super offended and think it's you, right? Like that's part of, data is really powerful for helping us understand where we are in space and that it's not personal. I think a lot of this is just under, it's not personal. Um, they're looking at these numbers and they're making their decisions blanket wise because of that. So if you're not being offered in advance because this publisher's thinking, I don't know, only 3% of the advances I ever pay are now, is this person going to blow us out of the water? So it's likely you might not see that advance. Well, okay. if, if they're only getting 3% to, I mean, paid out, to me, that's very bad decision making on their part. Yeah. I mean, the, the other thing is that they don't, they, they really cannot test market like a lot of other product categories can, but 3% to me is just, just I mean, it, it just, to, you know, as a business person, I just, that's it, staggering. It's, why, why isn't the obvious question, I'm sorry, isn't the obvious question, why don't they just decide to pay a higher royalty in the traditional publishing field and stop giving advances. And so, so you get a higher royalty on every book and they get a royalty and they don't have this huge expense of all the advances. Now I know advances aren't as common as they used to be, but still 3%. Yeah, well, that's exactly what they are doing is they're, they're not paying advances as, as they used to, unless you're a big one and then they're giving you millions of dollars. That's a controversial issue in publishing. Some authors are getting a million dollar advance and others are getting none. Um, but it's got, I mean, we could do this all day. Like there's so much in that. Like if you're not getting an advance, you're not given time to write without having to have another job. It just creates a, it, it creates this world in which there aren't professional authors anymore because you know, it, it's, it's complicated, but that's exactly what's happening. They're, they're not 
paying it. And that's why also we saw this huge rise of hybrid because publishers were like, I can't take on this risk. I'm gonna make you take on the risk, the financial risk of the thing. Um, I just threw on the screen what all of the publisher does. It's everything. And then this is my contact information available to you. I did it with um, one minute to spare. Oh wait, that's not my contact info. This is my contact info. Will there be any uh, time for a couple questions or do we need to conference planners? Uh, I, you know, we have like a minute or two. So if you want to, if we can keep it brief, then, uh, then we'll uh, introduce Michael. I'll take the hardest question you have. <laughs> and then we'll be done. I'll send these slides to uh, add into Charlotte and such and to Bill. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Angela. Uh, really, thank you. I think this has been great. And uh, the conversation has been great. Um, I was hesitant to say a minute or two because I think everyone here was wise enough to go, no, nothing we're going <laughs> to be a minute or two. So yeah. this has been a great talk. So thank you kindly. Absolutely. Um, thank you, guys. Have a great you. conference. Right thank on. You thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank yeah. you. See thank you, you so Angela. much, Angela. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great conference, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.